So my name is Jeff Rochester. Uh, to be clear, I'm not the CEO or founder of the Nature Conservancy. We're 60 years old, so I didn't found it. But I'm the chief marketing officer. Um, and to Carter, is Carter still here? Yep. Where are you, Carter? So, buddy, I got the Blackberry. <laughs> I got the wingtips. And I got the PowerPoint. So I don't know what that says. But not, not a good start. Not a good start, OK? So um, I'm going to talk to you about 15 minutes. I'm going to throw a lot of content your way. And the key message, I'm kind of an Amanda groupie, I'm an Elliot groupie, I'm a Summit Series groupie. Uh, I have one foot in the old world, old school, big organization, the Nature Conservancy, 4,000 employees, 60 years old, very conservative. So I have one foot in that world. I have another foot in this world, and this world kind of scares me because this is a very different kind of, you know, I don't emote, I don't share my feelings, I'm not that guy. <laughs> but, but, but to be clear, I'll start and I'll end with the same point. We need your help. The environment desperately needs your help. We're at a critical point right now. I was in Mexico last week. I'll be in Brazil in two weeks. I travel every week someplace. Um, and the state of our planet, not to overstate it because there's too much preachiness and scare tactics, but it's a complex problem, demands complex solutions, and we need better thinking. We need innovation, and we need catalysts. So the reason I'm here, the reason I go to Summit Series and some of these conferences is to encourage you to engage and help us. Help the big institutions, start your own, but help because we need help. So um, one of the reasons I'm here is to tell my own story. I won't share a lot, but I'll share a little. So this is where I grew up. This is 432 East 52nd Street in Brooklyn. So when you think about the environmental movement, this is not what you think about, right? This is Brooklyn, urban jungle, uh, New York. And for years, I worked for this guy. This is Vince McMahon, if you don't know him. He's the chairman and founder of World Wrestling Entertainment. And he's there with his best buddy, Donald Trump. And it was a stunt we had done. And uh, Vince lost, Trump won, so Vince had his head shaved ball, right? That's not what you think of when you think of the environmental movement. That's certainly not the image when you think of nonprofits and doing good in the world. But that was my background for three years. I ran marketing for them. And this is uh, Ash Meadow. This is a preserve. This is a plot of land in the Mojave Desert that our team, so the Nature Conservancy is in every state. Uh, some of the folks from our chapter are here. This is a piece of land we protected. We bought it about 30 years ago uh, to keep it from becoming a subdivision. So this is classic con conservation. Buy a plot of land to take it off the grid to protect it. And so what does a guy like me, who grew up in Brooklyn, worked for Vince McMahon, doing working with an organization like this, right? These images are starkly different. But this is where I was born. I was born in Barbados. And one of the key themes of my chat is that the environmental movement, unfortunately, has allowed itself to become elitist and narrow and non-engaging. And the best example I can give all of you of that is, uh, um, you know, Movember, right? Uh, the environmental movement needs a Movember. It's fun. It's accessible. It affects people at every a level of the income strata and race and sex, et cetera. But the environmental movement, at least in this country, has allowed itself to become disconnected from the public. So that's the key theme of my message. So I belong, right? I grew up in Barbados, I care. I grew up in Brooklyn. So I have a right to be as an environmentalist as anybody else. Um, and my tipping point, my catalytic point in my personal journey was when I was working at World Wrestling, this kind of uh, very different type of a brand, very aggressive brand. Uh, we did a lot of good in the world. So uh, the, all the pro-social efforts when I was there reported into me. So it's a young, youth-skewing brand. They did a lot for youth. They did a lot for the military. The picture in the top left, uh, every year we would send our wrestlers to Iraq and Afghanistan to entertain troops, I like Bob Hope. On the right, every year we would do a reading challenge with thousands of libraries around the uh, US to inspire kids to read. We were Make-A-Wish's biggest partner, one of their biggest partners. Uh, John Cena, that wrestler with the kid right there, he's given away, two, as of four years ago, he'd given away 600 wishes to young people. But I saw the power of a for-profit to help do good in the world. And that's something Amanda and I have talked about. You know, We really believe that if you're going to save this planet, you need an interdependency. So it's not just about individuals or corporations or nonprofits or governments. It's about all of them. So uh, my, part of my tipping point, uh, I had been, true story, I'd been talking to the Nature Conservancy for a couple of months about coming over to be their chief marketing officer. 
And I actually backed away because I felt there was a loss of power, quite frankly, if you knew, move from for-profit to non-profit. And I'm a cowboy at heart, and I didn't want to hang up my spurs. So I backed away. I exited out of the interview process. And then I saw this happen. It was the summer of 2010, and you had both the climate change debate and you had the health care debate. And interestingly, both of them had in common dominance of messaging. Right? So it's interesting that we're still talking about health care. So back in 2010, we were talking about health care. And they had the uh, messages like kill grandma and death panels. I'm like, this is marketing warfare. This is what I do for a living. And in the climate change debate, uh, the U.S. is one of the only countries that summer that was not able to come to come some kind of a legislative agreement on how to deal with climate change. And it traumatized the category. So WWF, EDF, the Nature Conservancy, all of us were stunned at that, uh, that loss. And what I saw from the outside looking in, because I wasn't working for the Nature Conservancy at the time, was the fact that these organizations need help. And quite frankly, they need the help that all of you have. You are brilliant. You're good at communicating. You're good at community building. You're good at this word called collision, which I've learned. If there's one thing I've learned out of this two days is the word collision. So I felt that it was time to make the plunge into the nonprofit world. I'd always worked in for-profit. I'd worked for Comcast and Showtime and World Wrestling. But the, my mission, my personal mission, and increasingly the mission of the environmental movement is to treat this notion of broadening beyond the choir as a key strategic objective. So this is a pie of the US population over the age of 18. There are 219 million Americans, 300 million total, 219 over the age of 18. Everybody focuses on this group we call the choir, 30 million Americans that self-identify. So they're people that are members of Sierra Club or WWF or EDF. There's 127 million, that's the group I wake up with. Every morning I wake up thinking, how do I get to that larger audience? And the Nature Conservancy has about a million members. And so what I think about are the tactics that I've learned over the years, and these are just some of the tactics that we, some of the, what I call the dark arts that we learned at World Wrestling, right? <laughs> Marketing tactics that don't cost a lot of money. It's just about innovation. It's guerrilla marketing. So top left, we had an event called WrestleMania. It was like our Super Bowl. And one of the strategies, would, we would come into a town and just own it, soup to nuts. So this was a year. These are all case studies from Orlando. I think this is uh, 2005. And top left, we uh, talked to a farmer quietly. We said we'd like to rent your land for a month. He didn't know who we were. We rented it. We painted a huge logo on the farm so that when planes were arriving in Orlando, they would see the WrestleMania logo landed on the front page of the newspaper. It cost us a couple of thousand bucks. When the farmer found out, we thought he'd be pissed off, and all he wanted was tickets to WrestleMania. <laughs> uh, stranger than, right? Uh, top right, we had a wrestler who was a great artist. He's a cartoonist. We convinced the Orlando Sentinel to do uh, a strip of cartoons four weeks in a row leading up to WrestleMania. Bottom left, we did gardening contests where people had to create the logo. Bottom right, we paid kids 500 bucks to have WrestleMania 23 uh, uh, cut into their hair. So, you know, how do you take these tactics and apply them to this very conservative, very kind of insular environmental movement? Um, so, a little bit about the Nature Conservancy, a little plug. We're 60 years old. We're the 16th largest nonprofit in the U.S. We've always been very quiet. There are about 1.2 million charities in the US. We're number 16. We raise about half a billion dollars a year. We're one of the largest NGOs around the world. And like I said, we have chapters in every state. Uh, top right, the most important thing to remember about us, we're scientific based. Right? A lot of complex issues facing the world, from climate change to fracking. We like to be the person in the room that can deal with these, peop these issues honestly, pragmatically, objectively. We're one of the only organizations in the world that can get ranchers and farmers in the same room. We can get Dow Chemical and activists in the same room. Because at the end of the day, we live in an interdependent world. It's not about the supremacy of one opinion over the other. Um, tell that to Capitol Hill, right? This is Ash Meadow. This, uh, actually, no, this is uh, Torrance Reserve. This is another place that we've worked with. Uh, this has one of the longest running rivers in the world running in, in underneath it. It's the Amar. Amargosa River, 125 miles long. This is a, an example of the type of work we've done for years, right? This is about biodiversity. This is an oasis. This is buying land to protect it, to nurture it so people can enjoy it and so species will thrive. Uh, so I wanted to uh, spend the rest of my time talking about urbanization and water. Those are the two big crises of the world. 
So you've seen the data between now and 2050, 2060, the population will go from seven to nine billion. The intriguing piece, and what's relevant to all of you, and one of the reasons I wanted to come here is it's all about urbanization. 50%, one, on a, one out of two of the world's population lives in cities right now. That number goes to about 80% by 2050. So the environmental groups have to learn new tricks. How do we deal with urbanization? What, what kind of conservation methods do we need to do? More importantly, how do we reach people in urban markets? And then, like it or not, Sandy was an advertising campaign for climate change. I live in New York, uh, conservative to left, you know, old, young. Everyone's opinion changed about the status of the planet after Sandy. There's been a huge tipping point around that. So increasingly, environmental work and urban work is around how to protect these cities. So for the Nature Conservancy, and increasingly for the category, you know, when I talked about Movember, we're trying to teach ourselves new tricks. So this is a promotion we did with Subway. Subway is the largest leading fast food restaurant in the world. They have 34,000 stores. This is a promotion we activated in North America from Canada down to the Caribbean. 24,000 stores. These are Happy Meal bags for kids. So this is just a different way to engage youth. But it's not the kind of stuff you see environmental groups doing. We did a promotion with Macy's to, uh, to put forward our work around the Am Amazon. They wanted to help save the Amazon. Uh, they did an integrated promotion with us just about a year and a half ago. Raised $3 million by selling a $3 gift card to a million people in three weeks. And the promotion was, if you care about the Amazon, buy this card to propel TNC's uh, work. But you don't see environmental groups doing this. You see um, St. Jude's doing stuff like this. You see Susan G. Komen doing stuff like this. I'll tell you who's one of the better innovators in the category is Charity Ward. They do a phenomenal job of engaging audiences in non-traditional tactics around the environment. Uh, we did picnics, so we could sit back and for Earth Day we could preach to everybody, tell you how bad everything is and make you feel really down, or we could try and celebrate our, the planet Earth. So the past two years, we had 1,200 picnics around the world. We encouraged consumers to just go outside, chill, just go outside and relax and enjoy this great planet Earth. So these are the kinds of strategies we're trying to invoke. And then, um, you know, talking about catalysts and change is, you know, a personal perspective is when you're trying to be a change agent in an organization, every day is a day fraught with uh, good, bad, and the ugly. So this is a picture of Mark Hans. He's my, he's my new best pal. He's the chief marketing officer of Harley Davidson. I'm actually headed to Wisconsin to meet with him Tuesday. True picture, this is him giving a leather jacket to the Pope last summer. So uh, 2013 is the 110th anniversary of Harley Davidson. And uh, they went to the Vatican to celebrate. They had thousands of Harley riders there. So we too did a deal with Harley. And my point is if Harley's good enough for the Pope, I think he's good enough for the Nature Conservancy. So they, uh, we did a deal with them to plant 110,000 trees in Brazil for climate change. Um, these two guys, this was almost the death of me. My team came to me about a year ago and said they wanted to do a, a deal with a guy called Macklemore. I said, who? So I go online, I Google. Of course, what comes up is an uncut video, right? And I'm like, OK, I'm not going to do this deal. So my team, to their credit, pushed me three, four times, and we finally did a deal with them. But again, you don't see environmental groups doing deals like this. And then, uh, then youth, youth outreach. This is a picture of something that the program here, our Nevada chapter, has a relationship with the uh, Desert Conservation Program around Mojave Max. He's a character. He appeals to kids. Right now, we have two or three programs that are outreach programs to kids. We do um, mentorship of urban kids to develop the next generation of leaders. Uh, we've been running that program for years. And we've got a great partnership with Discovery. For those of you, a couple of you are into education. Discovery is, has one of the largest educational units in the world. They have a database of a million teachers. And we're pushing content to them about the environment. So finally, uh, water. When you look at issues of water, the three areas that we're very focused on is water protection, financing, these financial mechanisms to help you value water more effectively, and then activating urban residents. And what's, what I'm very happy about, and the reason why I wanted to talk to all of you is increasingly every environmental group has a strategy around engagement and communications. So what the Nature Conservancy is very focused on is doubling investments in natural infrastructure for the top 50 cities in the world, securing 5% of traded water rights. What that means is farmers, corporations are securing water rights. But who's securing water rights for the environment and for nature? So increasingly in all the countries we compete, we're looking to secure 5% of the water rights. This is the Colorado River. You know it. Seven states, our chapter. So our team here is working on exactly that, securing water rights for the Colorado River to replenish it. Uh, in Latin America, we've created an advertising campaign to inspire kids to care about the 
the environment. Uh, we've even met with soap opera stars to encourage them to write pro-social messaging into their TV shows. We've even met with the Miss Venezuela contest. It's a true story. We met with them last summer. Um, the beauty contest was one of the biggest things in, that happens in Venezuela to inspire them to have pro-social messaging. And then uh, one of the last things I just want to talk about is SmartTap. This is an example of innovation. This is a company we're looking to do business with. Uh, if you know City Bites in New York, their vision is to create uh, high-powered taps in cities around the world to get all of these plastic disposable bottles off the streets to make it easy for you. And we're looking to partner with them. So again, you know, my talk was more about innovation to give you a sense of some of the innovative things that are happening in the category. So the last point I want to make, who here has been to Red Rock? Okay, so my last appeal to all of you, so I'll end as I started. I'll end with the shout out that we need help. We need you to engage. If there's one thing you can all do is to go outside, enjoy this nature. This is 20 minutes away from here, 20 to 40 minutes, depending on what part you're going to. But we desperately need help. So start your own NGO, help one of the big boys, help the Nature Conservancy. We've got people here. But uh, we need catalytic change. We need a collision to help us all kind of in improve this great planet Earth. So thank you very much.